you all for coming. Thank you, Tefa, for having us. Thank you, Michael Plummer, for all your support for many years, and Jeff Rubin, your partner. And of course, I have to thank especially Linda Lees, who pushed and shoved and insisted that we have this panel here today. I, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I also want to thank my fellow colleagues and friends, or friends and colleagues, for coming and participating in this panel today. Uh, we want to talk about Latin America, but we also want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of being classified as Latin Americanists. And uh, I have to say that the, we have four professionals here that have been working in the field for many years with very prominent positions in, in many ways. And uh, I'm going to introduce them and myself by saying how we've met. I have to start with Leon Tovar. Raise your hand, please. How are you? <laughs> Leon, I met uh, as a teenager in Bogota. He's Colombian as well. And uh, there and then, the thing that most impressed me about him was that he was already knowledgeable about Warhol and Sol LeWitt. I still wasn't. And he also had VIP access to the best nightclubs of the city. So since then, we've been friends. <laughs> the second person I met was Christian Viveros Fane, who uh, I met when I first came to New York, and I was working with the Colombian Mission to United Nations, which was a very in interesting institution. It was uh, funded by a wonderful culture attaché, who's also a grand dame of the arts, and I know that client of many of the TEFAF participants. Mrs. Uh, Beatriz Ayla Santo Domingo, and she uh, gave me the opportunity to organize the cultural program for the Colombian Mission. And we, of course, needed an editor and translator. And I don't remember who recommended Christian exactly, but he came to us and he became literally my right hand in every single publication. And then he went on ahead to forge his own journalist, bueno, gallerist affair and journalist career, which we're going to try and talk about both with Latin America and outside Latin America. Third comes my dear friend Gabriela, who is Venezuelan, and we fight a lot about the origin of the arepa, which of course is Colombian. <laughs> she might, once she gets the microphone, she might say An international fight. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are two Colombians in this panel, so today, yeah, it's, yeah, we share it. But I've met Gabriela when she was working at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, when the Latin American uh, department under Mari Carmen Ramirez, Ramirez had opened. And I was very impressed by her quickness, knowledge, and, uh, um, and her curatorial knowledge. And, what she, and she's here now in New York with the America Society as director of the visual arts, an institution that has also been close to my heart. And, uh, and ho luckily, Gabriela has me as part of her advisory board. And last but not least, Iria, who I met when she was about to move to London to work for Tate. And we were introduced by a common friend who is Maria Inez Rodriguez, also Colombian, and who is now the director of the CAPC in Bordeaux, the museum in Bordeaux. So um, this is a panelist of very prominent and well international Latin Americanists. And uh, I want to start um, by saying that we have to leave at 10, at 11.30 sharp. So if you, you see my phone going crazy, it's because we have to wrap up. That's why I have it here. Uh, and also that um, to start, we, I want to position you in the, in the broader landscape of what Latin American art is, or the landscapes. And I'm going to pass this to Gabriela Rangel, who has worked on mapping this in the last few years. And this is in opposition to many of the overall reports and uh, reviews that we hear about the global market when Latin America usually falls within the category of the, the other. Gabriela. So what is the question, Anna? That, um, I want you to map the, map us the current landscape. The current landscape is uh, very complex right now to what, vis-a-vis um, -vis what we had in 2001. In 2001, we had the Museum of Modern Art the American Society, the Blanton Museum in Austin, Texas, uh, to lesser extent, El Museo del Barrio, the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, which was beginning, and LAGMA in Los Angeles with colonial art. This is um, six institutions, right, uh, in 2001. Then in 2015, which are my, my it's the end of my, my diagram, we have now the Tate Modern, the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, 
the Guggenheim Museum in New York, the Phoenix Art Museum in Arizona, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the John Paul Getty Museum, Los Angeles, the Jewish Museum, New York, and in Latin America we have Museo de Arte Latinoamericano de Buenos Aires, Malva, Mali, Lima, Muac, Mexico City, which is a museum of contemporary art of the, of the university, uh, Museo de Antioquia, Medellín, Biblioteca Luis Ángel Arango, Colombia, Bogotá, and Museo de Medellín, right? So we have a much more complex um, landscape than uh, at the very beginning. We had some other cases before that, but they are not relevant anymore. I have to say that Latin American art became not only a trend, but it's a demographic situation in the US, and we have to point out that. And that's the reason why Mr. Donald Trump attacked uh, Mexico, because we are a very important demographic trend, uh, and we are a force, a cultural force in the US. Bilingual, the bilingual situation is very important as well, as well as the language of art as um, something that is international in Latin America. Yeah, it's 17% seven, of the population of the United States, actually. We're the largest minority. Um, pardon my voice. <laughs> we don't know talk like this, obviously. Um, but yeah, just in terms of percentages. To go to Leon, and I also want to, because we did talk about uh, many of the galleries that have been working with Latin American artists since before what we now call Latin American art. So if you can talk about some of the galleries in New York and elsewhere that we mentioned, and uh, tell us how that landscape in the gallery scene has changed. Yeah, I think um, Claude Bernard and, and also um, Averbach, Jan Averbach, they started like uh, probably more than 30 years ago. And, um, but they change a lot. Now they are, we are in, a, in the cultural main street. Uh, many international galleries, they start to be interested in our market and in, in the Latin American artists, actually. We have uh, some galleries in New York that are solely dedicated to Latin American art. Well, and we have we, one we, here, which is Marianne Martin We have Martin uh, with Marianne us. Martin. We have uh, Cecilia de Torres, uh, our gallery, Leon Tovar. We used to have another one. Uh, I think uh, Barquet was... Enrique Faria, for example, they have a very important uh, gallery related with the conceptual art, and I think they're increasing a little bit in New York. Uh, Gabriel, I know that at one point you said that, I mean, I, I want to mention some of the Latin American artists that are in international galleries, and they're never classified as Latin Americanist. Uh, we can start with Zwerner and Francis Alice, Alexander and Bonin with Doris Salcedo, uh, Tania Bonactar with Ernesto Neto, Sikema Jenkins and Company with Vic Muniz, James Cohen with Beatriz Millases, uh, uh, Sean Kelly with, started with Los Carpinteros and Irando Espíritu Santo, now Jose Dávila, Listen Gallery recently with Carmen Herrera and Pedro Reyes, White Cube, Gabriel Orozco, Doris, uh, and um, uh, White Cube in London, Gabriel Orozco, Doris Salcedo, Damian Ortega, Barbara Gladstone, Damian Ortega, Marian Goodman, Gabriel Orozco, Adrián Villa Rojas, uh, Alison Jacks, Ligia Clark, today Hauser and Worth with both Ana Maria Maiolino and um, Ligia Pape, and the list can go on. And I know that we, when we were having the earlier conversation, Gabriela said that for some of them, the early ones at least, there had been a uh, critical apparatus that was in place, and I want you to talk about it and how you feel about it. Well, you know, we know identity is fluid and national identities in the 90s became very much questioned by a generation of artists. And before that, Sildo Meireles and, and, and uh, Elio Etisica questioned the national identity of Brazilian and Latin American art uh, in a way that um, it allowed curators, not only artists, but curators to construct a different kind of identity. That it's fluid, it's, it's, not, it's not stable, and artists did the same thing. And in a very particular way, people like Gabriel Orozco, who created his own way to present art, to be interpreted, and also to circulate in the global markets, right? So I think it's very important to point out that because these artists are not seen as Latin American artists, and they're seen as Latin American artists. Meaning that sometimes they are Latin American when, it, when, it's, when it's relevant for them to be, and sometimes they're not. They're international that's what we've done artists. all our lives. That's why we're here. <laughs> exactly. And uh, what, what is interesting is the way that um, these galleries are 
just considering them not for their provenance or, you know, it, they're, they're, they're like the wine, you know? The, it, it doesn't matter if it's Chilean or Argentine, it circulates because it's a, it's a good Carmenere or Merlot, right? So we flavor them in the international markets as artists who are relevant in, the, in mapping contemporary art, presenting problems that are relevant for today's world. Iria, how do you see that from an institutional point of view? Well, I mean, just to come, I mean, um, to in the conversation, which is very interesting, you know, addressing, uh, I mean, the concept, the category of Latin American art, uh, how we distinguish what's inside, outside, uh, the, the inner evolution that this whole category has been uh, experiencing through the past years, right? I mean, if you just um, look at the map that you just mentioned, uh, Gabriela, it's very interesting because, I mean, in recent years, uh, the whole decolonizing sort of um, discourse and narrative have made that the traditional Eurocentric, no Western canon, uh, the Western mapping of the art history has changed. So now you're basically be able to look in beyond those uh, Eurocentric uh, frontiers to include art made in all latitudes. Um, just, I just want to remember something beautiful that yesterday um, Paolo Herkenhoff said when he uh, gave a keynote lecture at the Metropolitan, we organized a symposium in conjunction with the Lija Papa exhibition. And he said something beautiful about it, which is today, when he actually planned um, a very important Biennale at the Sao Paulo that he created back in 1998 already, called uh, the Biennale of the Anthropophagia. He already wanted to challenge and to attempt to kind of destroy, you know, the previous um, cartographic assumptions about the art map. And he said, whatever, whenever, whatever a good artist is, that's the center of the world. And basically, I think that's a very beautiful poetic metaphor to somehow tackle this issue today. I think we are already past this very rigid, homogenic, homo homogeneous notion of what a Latin American art is, Latin America is as a continent, as, you know, as a plurinational continent, um, which is very, very complex. And the people who are working in the field in the past years we just try to make that emphasis. I mean, it's such a conflict, complex place with so many countries, with so many, you know, in, in, in different histories with their own, within their own countries, with colonization, with their neighbor countries. The, the different languages are being speak. If you think of the Caribbean, there's Suriname, they speak Dutch. I mean, there's whole, I mean, very complex uh, 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 continent to tackle just as a very, with a very narrowed, you know, um, uh, and, and simplifying category. So I think the more we broaden the map itself, the more we complicate it, the better, because it's so rich intellectually, and there are so many artists that nobody knows yet in the, you know, in the Western countries. I just made a, an exhibition of Lija Pape at the Met, and it's really the first major show ever devoted to the artists in this country. There was a very beautiful show on Lija Pape in America Society in 2002, I think. It was kind of a small attempt to kind of open up the windows. And um, so just so to say that institutionally, there's been a huge movement and change of perspectives and in looking far beyond Eurocentric um, uh, map to look at experiences and art practice beyond that map. And that's a very good move, and it's a difficult move to, to make in, within the institutions, even if you think of the MET, that it was born almost 150 years ago as an encyclopedic collection that basically, in its own inception, was looking at the art made in all the corners of the world, but, and yet, in the 20th century, and looking at the art of the 20th century and 21st century, they never pay attention whatsoever to what was happening but, you know, uh, underneath the Mexican border. Uh, and that's, you know, that brings up many other conversations and questions about what institutions made in the past and we can, what we can do in the future, but we can just Gabriela, go on. Gabriela, Gabriela, and, then I, and then I want to ask both Christian and Leon something. Yeah. No, maybe, maybe Christian can and, and Leon can elaborate this, but I was surprised when, uh, when Catherine David, you know, the curator of Documenta Tank, would change the whole template of Documenta, we know, uh, she gave me a class at uh, BART, at the Center for Curatorial Studies, when I was studying there. And she said something that for me was offensive, but it was really a truth. She said, Latin American art is Western. And I was really offended because I took for granted that it's Western. But then, I, 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 as a professional in New York, I was working with a mainstream institution, I won't say the name, in New York, and then the curator told me, the curator of photography told me that Latin American photography is not Western, is not part of the canon. And I was really surprised. And I remember those words by Catherine David, and I said, she was right. Nobody, nobody believes that we are Western. 
And do, do people know that photography was invented in, 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 uh, in France and in Brazil at the same time? Do we know that? No. So it's our, it's our, it's our duties to disseminate that knowledge and not to fight in an in a, you know, unproductive way. I think it, it, it will be more interesting to do what I think we're doing, you know, like insert, you know, those viruses everywhere. Anyway. And I want to say, uh, sorry, Idia, but before we go on and you respond, I want to ask Christian and Leon in that order, within your uh, work as a journalist and with your past experiences, how, what space have you been able to give to Latin America or how do you, how do you affront that problem? Do you affront it as a continent? Do you affront it as a, as a categorization? And then Leon and your experience as, an, as a gallerist, um, I, I know that you have a lot to say about the auctions, and we would like to hear about that as well. As a, as a journalist, and I, uh, I'm writing for the Village Voice again, but I wrote for them for about a decade um, as their principal critic. So every week, essentially, my job is to go out and find the most relevant show. Um, and oftentimes, it was a Latin American show, but clearly, they're also sort of my interests, right? Um, so uh, I. I, because I'm Chilean and, and I, I have a certain, um, my background gives me an immediate affinity to things that maybe other journalists and, um, uh, and the public at large doesn't know about. So I, I, I know certain things when they come up. I know that Oite Chica is an interesting uh, um, or an important artist, you know, maybe a decade and a half ago uh, in my own education um, before the Whitney decides to give him a show, which by the way is another significant indicator of how, of how much the ground has shifted. It's the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, is he Latin American? Is he not Latin American? Um, I, I think one of the things that I find interesting in this, in this discussion is how convenient and inconvenient the label of Latin American is. Often, it's the kind of label. And traditionally, it's been the kind of label that Latin American artists use to sort of get on the map. But the minute they get on the map, they want to run away, and they're right to. It's limiting. Um, so it's either an umbrella uh, uh, for a day like today or a context like today, um, uh, or you know, it's it's the opposite. It's a cage, and 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 that's something that I think curators clearly understand, dealers clearly understand. Uh, consultants like yourself clearly understand and journalists also sort of understand. As a mission, as a journalist, part of what you want to do is to, is to give, again, writing for the general public, an idea of something new. When you go out, you are very interested in getting a surprise, right? You want to see things. Um, you want to look at something that, that gives you just a blast of uh, information and of culture uh, and of experience. And, and you want to communicate that to, obviously, your audience. And oftentimes, I've found um, that in looking at um, underrepresented work by Latin Americans, of course, um, you, you have a, a terrific ability to sort of communicate that surprise. And, and that, that I, I love, aside from the fact that sometimes I get to write about friends, right? Or, or folks that, that have been significantly sort of underrepresented and, and, and are underknown. Um, but do you find a resistance at times from the editorial teams of the of the journals where you work, saying, "Oh no, this is uh, maybe this is not interesting to the public"? Or um, I, I know the answer personally, no. But I know the answer is the general answer is yes, because otherwise we we wouldn't have had this trajectory, right? Um, uh, I, I think at, at the at the voices desk, at least for a while, people trusted me enough that if I said it was important than they thought it was as well. But I know that that's the case. Um, uh, you know, otherwise we wouldn't just be having, um, well, clearly the second Ligia Puppy exhibition in New York City. Um, we, would have, we would have thought that, that this was an artist um, that was as crucial as, they, as, as you know, the history books know where to be. Um, so. And Leon. Well, in our experience um, after I think in the last 15 years has been happening very important exhibitions, museum exhibitions, more than 30 or 40 international about Latin America. Um, our feeling is that we are in the main street now in the, in the museum level, but in the auction houses we still, at the beginning was very important to open these departments, but 
Today we have like a roof. We are trapped in a very small market, which is Latin America. I think it's the time to break that, not to disappear the departments, but to merge these departments with the other ones. Like, for example, if it's a Reveron or, um, you know, Impressionist Latin American art, thing, go to the Impressionist department. Matalam, they need to go to the Surrealist department. The Soto, Le Parc, Cruz Diaz can be in the modern department. I think this, that's the only break that we need to do now, and it's part of our mission. I almost feel like asking Marianne Martin a question in the audience of saying how that label start, helped to start the market. And if I may, I'm going to pass the voice to you. <laughs> this is totally unprepared. Probably. Yeah, right, well, I, I've, I've sort of been living it. but. I am the person, in a way, who created a Frankenstein monster because I was sort of bored working in the Impressionist and Modern department at Sotheby's, and by chance I saw one or two. Uh, it started out with a Rivera, then a Merida. These things would trickle in, uh, basically, they in estates, you know, or in Orozco. Somebody died, somebody had one of these things. We would, it would turn up in the department, and one of my problems was trying to hang it. It was, you know, we put, had Diego Rivera, we would put it with a Cubist painting, and you know, it was, we, we knew what to do with the things that were traditional, but then once they started becoming um, well, more typical of what the artist did, there, there was no, you know, just arranging an exhibition was difficult. So I got this idea, and I have to really compress it, of uh, doing a Mexican auction, not a Latin American auction. And first we had a little trial balloon inside of a modern sale. Then I went down to Mexico and gave everybody a catalog who was a subscriber. That was about 20 people. About three of them subscribed to paintings, five of them to jewelry, and the rest to furniture. But people started coming up for the sales. It was really, I, I hate to look at it this way, but we, we sort of packaged first Mexican art, then Latin American art, People kept on saying, why don't you do a Latin American sale? And I say, well, there's so many countries, it's not just like, you know, I'd, I had like one book, you know, in the beginning. And uh, then the Center for Inter-American Relations wanted America to do Society. A, no, it, but then it was called the CIAR. They wanted to do a, a benefit auction, and so we collaborated with them, and that was, you know, suddenly an evening sale, because I told... What, what year is this, I'm sorry? Uh, th this is like 76, 77, 78. And um, there really were s some shows that took place before that, but, you know, I mean, major. I mean, but it had to do with personalities. Thomas Messer was interested in Latin American art, so there, were, there was a show, The Mexico Splendors of 30 Centuries. That happened, what, in 1988 or... Not, I mean, there were some big shows at, at places, but that was sort of the past. And... Um, we really made it a category so that we could, you know, sell these things. And then, I, I mean, I personally was told by Jose Luis Cuevas, he said, I am not, uh, I am not Latin American, I am international. And, mm, you know, Mr. Botero was furious because I stole him from the modern sales where they weren't making that much money, put them in Latin American sales, and the prices started going up. Still today. Today. He's still today. Yeah. He, it's the he same is the way. biggest you know, living years. artist at auction. Biggest well, Latin Frida American. Kahlo. I mean, I, I hate to say this because, you know, I mean, I was, we were including works by Frida Kahlo. Now, there, is there any other exhibition anywhere that's not Frida Kahlo? I mean, it's, it's too much. But um, anyway, I, I, I could go on and on. We have another symposium. But it was really a good intention on my part to, uh, to do an auction that would include all these different artists that were not being included at all. And the name Latin American, I, it wasn't South American because, as we know, Mexico is in North America. Even Mr. Trump should know that. Perhaps that connects to why it was so useful, the category, at, at a certain moment, right? Well, to just be, be able to visualize These things whole, were not in the auctions at all. It's like a so, whole you know, new, uh, right? I mean, yeah. art practice that hadn't have been seen or recognized exactly. within the art market, but also in the art institution. I think there was, when Gabriela was saying earlier, I mean, what happened in 2000, Museums like Fine Art, uh, mm -hmm. Museum Fine Art Houston, starting to pay attention. It was necessary 
to claim, right, like a site-specific place for Latin American art, just to, just to be able to facilitate the visibility, I mean, within the public and within the audiences. But maybe now we are in the second stage or even a third stage in which that's not necessary anymore. You really However, I think, you I think the category is useful because the category is just yeah. allow us just to keep, you know, problematizing it. And by problematizing it, we're just enriching the dialogue yeah. and making the, the, the conversation yeah. more complex. Absolutely. And, 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 and avoiding cliches once again that just bring us again to brand names like Carlo or Rivera. We don't want to fall again by today defining that Latin American art today is Gabriel Orozco no. or or well, Anna Soto Soto only. So is we're trying responsible to responsible for changing that in, in the auctions because mm -hmm. when she came to Christie's, the one. Uh, yeah. and, with the, you know, with and the, the older the clients you know, were saying, what is this, you know, things on the floor and, uh, you know, I don't know what this is. And you must have had to suffer a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. It's true. She it's cried. True. But I was going to say something. Let's move uh, in a different direction. I think the category Latin American art is not the problem. The problem is the notion of the avant-garde. That's what we have to problematize. It's not the category Latin American art, that's a marketing category, and that's a branding that it's, was invented by the cultural diplomacy in the 19th century. It's so aged and outdated that I won't discuss that. But the notion of avant-garde is our problem right now, is are we going to problematize the avant-garde in the terms of the October group, uh, you know, accustom us to do it? Eurocentric and North American, or are we going to say that Diego Rivera is as avant-garde as Picasso? I'm sorry, but that's what we Gabriela, have to say. Gabriela, that's very, I mean, I'm glad you said that and I'm glad you mentioned that. And so the question now in, in looking at the panel and where we are today is, what is the commercial part of the market, like Leon? Uh, what are his good? What are going to be his good intentions, as Marianne nicely put it, for the future? And what you, as a curator, and Edia, as well as a curator and institution, and you as a journalist, what are your good intentions for the future to try and uh, create a, 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 or erase that that distinction and that canon? And I'm, I, I don't know who wants to answer first, but I want all of you to give me a good intention for the future. Well, in, in our cases, we are doing these exhibitions, important uh, exhibitions, but it's related, I will back a little bit to the auctions. We have a roof in the prices. We, we compete with the other markets, but we spend exactly the same amount of money to participate in an ad fair, and our neighbor is, for example, uh, Christopher Wall. You know, Christopher Wall was $100,000 three years or four years ago, now it's $10 million. We compete with this type of market, you know, um, thanks to... Are the fairs like this one helping you? Yeah, they help a lot, uh, definitely. Um, but we cannot depend on Salma Hayek to put uh, Frida Kahlo in the market, you know. It, it, it's, it's, something, it, it's something crazy, you know. The people, they ignore a lot. And um, part of that is the, the, the we are not in the main street in the auction houses, actually. I, I think we need to break that. So you would break the auction houses and you would participate in other type of fairs because we haven't, I mean, we're here in a fair, but there's another fair in the city going on. There's several fairs in Latin America. We are, we are one Latin of America. the few galleries there. You participate in some of these fairs. There's also Bergamingo, Bergamingo Mide here in the audience. Exactly. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit about what your well, experience we, has we been. Well, we are a few galleries that they can participate in 10, 11 art fairs internationally because the prices are still too low. Uh, still, uh, um, let's put it like that. Uh, if you we go in the right direction in the auction houses, I'm completely sure that Mata one day they will be more expensive than Gurk, you know. And as everybody knows, probably that's a personal opinion. I consider him more important as an artist, even than than Gorky. But it's a market uh, situation. I see Christian going like that. <laughs> you know. Um, I'm, I'm not going to discuss whether he's more important than Gorky or not, but, but look, I, I, in answer to your question, I think all of us here wear a lot of hats, right? Um, uh, we are uh, sort of survivors of the art world, um, and, and so we have different ways in which we um, try and um, guide uh, collectors to work, work to collectors, uh, stories to um, uh, publications, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, proper commentary to catalog essays, et cetera, et cetera. 
And, and in my case, you know, I, I, I write and, and I do quite a bit of curatorial, mostly at the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo in Santiago, Chile, but also in a couple of museums in Spain. Um, uh, and, you know, those bridges are ones you try to make because, I, you know, I think, you know, I try to make the personal, not because I'm looking at, to, to, to build the brand of Latin American art. I'm basically looking to, be, to, to help work that I think is really important get on and maybe get past a couple of hurdles that shouldn't be there. I mean, you know, the artists that I'm trying to promote, I think are artists that are important, where, whether I'm trying to do so on the page or whether I'm trying to do so in a museum. Um, and, and, in, and in that sense, I'll connect back to your comment about the avant-garde or at least the forward guard or whatever we can call it now. But you're looking to me to do it? No, thanks, I'm not doing it. Um, uh, the cutting edge, which is also equally odious um, and, and meaningless, but but clearly work that that you know is ahead of its time, work that again sort of generates surprise as opposed to sort of generating the opposite, you know, and you you try and help that work, those artists um, uh, get a, a better footing, you know, both in terms of uh, the professionalization of the work, being in institutions. Um, uh, being in being in galleries, making those entrees or those relationships happen, but also again on the printed page and ho hopefully to the general public, and to the degree that journalists have any say so in you know what we know to be this fickle thing that is art history, then maybe pushing in that direction as well, you know. Iria, how are you? Okay. Gabriela, you want to go first? Or Iria, how are you breaking the canons? I think, by just going back to what I was saying, um, this is an interesting moment now, at least what the Met can do, um, uh, for example. Um, I mean, one thing which we, I was talking the other day with a collector um, that was saying, there isn't any museum in the world that tells you the story of Latin American art, you know, from the beginning of times to today. You cannot see that anywhere. And, 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 you know, there are many countries, there's a lot of Do history. Do we need that? Museum, eh? Do we need that? No, 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 I'm just, I'm just posing it as a question, and you know, as a, as a really interesting argument to begin with. Uh, at the Met, for example, we have different departments that cover the area of the Americas, and it's um, subdivided, as you know, I mean, at the Met we have 17 departments, and, uh, and for example, pre, pre Columbian art, art of the ancient Americas, is within the um, art of Africa and the Americas and then Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, and then colonial um, art of the Americas, for example, is within the American wing, and then Latin American art in the last two centuries is uh, within the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art. But we can collaborate, I mean, as curators, we can collaborate together in thinking about projects that we connect, we could do trans-historic dialogues, for example. That would be something very interesting to do in the context of a museum. But also in terms of what's the next stage for museums in America, for example, to deal with Latin American art, I think there's a moment now in which we are at the, at the moment, and in which, coming back to what you're saying, let's put the world together. Let's put the world side by side. Let's put Lydia Pape side by side, Frank Estella, Correct. and Francis Morris. Let's see what's happening there. Put them together in a room see what they were doing, what they were doing, and the days, what they were doing, the work they were doing. And that's very interesting because then many new questions will arise because we will be surprised to see that many breakthrough moments in the history of contemporary art actually happened in Rio de Janeiro in the late 50s rather than in New York in the early 60s. Yeah. That's something very interesting. There, there, there are a lot of Edison and Marconi yeah, moments like that. Yes. But wait, Sorry. Um, I, I agree with, with you all um, in that, that it's important to collaborate, especially you, who work for an encyclopedic museum. But this happened already like 15 years ago, so there is an amnesia. I think the problem that we have to tackle is the academia and where people study our history and criticism. What is the formation of these people? Because you, you find quite often curators in your museums that say, no, Latin Americans are not in the Western canon, or no, this is a derivative, derivative artist. So if or you don't, if don't, you don't know, attack, but what's the challenge? No, I say if you don't that attack the problem from the academia, you're not going to do anything else. You know, you're going to repeat the same story. Lija, Lija Pape was decentered by Paulo Herkenhoff at the Museum of Modern Art in 2000. And I saw the exhibition. It was called The, the Marriage Between uh, Reason and Squalor. And it was a beautiful exhibition, and nobody remembers. But and especially the curators, they don't remember. They didn't see anything. 
and, and the collectors. So we have to go back to you know, the academia and to educate people in a different kind of situation and because otherwise we're gonna repeat the same story, the same story, the same story. Don't you see the ground shifting at all? I mean, I agree with you. But you know, I think this is clearly a problem of cultural self-sufficiency. But I do see things happening, for example, maybe, I mean, clearly things are happening in New York, the shows that we've been talking about. Um, in Los Angeles, when was it, 2015, they did a big Latin American thing that the and Getty put together, the LA, 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 exactly. LA. Um, but, but what I find almost more interesting is what's actually going on sort of like south of the border to use an Americanism, right? No one uses that uh, from the south. Um, and I've been, the last couple of times I've been down to Mexico City, I've noticed that there have been shows on that are shows of North American artists. Um, uh, um, there was a Malevich show in Buenos Aires last fall. Right, where, where was that? Proa. At the, Pro, at the Proa. Proa Foundation. Okay. And now there's going to be a Warhol show that Malba and Humix put together, for which there is no intention to bring that show up to North America. Uh, there was a general idea show at Humix again, not going to Canada, not coming up here. Um, uh, and another great show also at Mark, same, same, same stuff. That brings up a very interesting, interesting question too, which is, the, I mean, the potential for collaboration also across the Americas between museums. We also have an, an internal, an internal of circuit museums at, of museums to collaborate, you know, within America, but what happens about, you know, um, partnering with actually in museums in, in South America that already have the capacity But where to I'm going is they're putting together show, world-class shows of, uh, you know, Important shows, art. conceptual arts. Pardon me. Art. Yes. Yes. Without any aid from the north, and I think that's fantastic. I think that's amazing. And again, going back to the issue of cultural self-sufficiency, definitively a step in the right direction. You know. Okay. I want to close because my alarm clock already sounded, and that means that we have to wrap up very quickly. I want to close with education. I mean, clearly, right now the word of mouth or what is in fashion right now is everybody talking about the Institute for Latin American Studies that MoMA is going to open, funded by uh, the Cisneros Foundation that already existed as in some version in Museum of Fine Arts. So in Houston. In, yes, in Houston, correct, in the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. So what, how do you, I mean, do you see this as something that, again, going back to, okay, this is All another categorizing institution with a lot of money. So how can we look at that and, and uh, confront that uh, going forward? I think it's a, the, the natural competition between institutions. I think the Museum of Fine Arts Houston put together a very impressive program. And I have to say that I respect Mark Carmen for that reason, because if you go to the webpage, you can get a document translated already and understandable in English and in Portuguese and in Spanish. You have the three languages on the web of the, of the, of the uh, original sources of Latin American art. If you want a manifesto, if you want an article, if you, whatever, you know, you find everything in the web for free. I don't know how can MoMA defeat this. Uh, anyway, I think it's a very good intention and I celebrate that. The more we have, the more informed people are. So I, we, I we have to celebrate that. I agree with that. I think every, I mean, every initiative on that direction is always it's positive and good. It's positive. It's just what you do with it. Is that what you are able to, to accomplish? And the in terms of the graduate art history programs, one would have to point out the one of the Institute of Fine Arts with Edward Sullivan heading it. But what about Columbia, Yale, Harvard? It is a problem because the template is the October group. And the October group is profoundly Eurocentric and North American oriented. So, but it's true. I mean, you, you, can, you, can, you can review the, the magazines and also the book, you know, art from the 19th century uh, to the 1990s to, to the 2000s, right? Yes. The only artists who are there are Lisa Clark, Elio Tisica, and Gego. Do you think that's possible in the 20th century? No, we know it's not possible. So, um, I think, you know... There's a whole new, I mean, new, new generation of scholars and, and, you know, students now accomplishing and developing uh, graduate research and, you know, and projects in American academia, for example, and that would be a generation very interesting to follow not up. Not only in American academia, I have, I'm sorry, I'm, no, not, I'm, I mean, not that you, I'm, I'm not that American-centric. I think no, no, I there are a lot of Latin Americans here now talking in the same terms. And not because they were formed in the academia in the U.S., they're coming to, 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 talk, to, 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 to teach here. 
it's lingua no, franca. But, but I was following up the question of what's academia happening. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, this, uh, a lot happening now, I, I mean, in graduate programs across, I mean, in, uh, American uh, academia, I mean, what's mentioned. Andrea Junta was here, uh, and she's in Argentine, and yeah. she's crucial to understand the 1960s in Latin America with her book on internationalism. And she was invited by the University of Texas at Austin. She was invited to Columbia, and she was invited to Princeton. And I think the more north-south we have exchange, the less you know, misunderstandings we will have in the academia. And I think that that goes back to what Christian was mentioning about these very uh, deep, deeply researched monograph exhibitions happening in Latin American institutions. And I agree that that sort of uh, interchange would be very good. I think we have to wrap up unless you have a final comment to say. Uh, we can have one question. <laughs> uh, any questions? Any? Well, we thank you all for coming and sharing with us this sort of uh, conversation that, as you can see, is, has not been solved and will continue to raise a lot of issues and feathers and situations. But we thank, again, Linda and Tefa for having us.